in this video is our sense of sound or audition. So in order for us to hear something, we need two things. First, we need some sort of environmental stimulus, and in the case of sound, the stimulus is something known as a pressurized sound wave. So a pressurized sound wave is basically just compressed air that results from a whole bunch of different things, and we'll talk about that in a second. The second thing that we need is some sort of receptor in the body, so some sort of receptor that's able to take this pressurized sound wave and convert it into a neural impulse that your brain can understand. So in the case of sound, the receptor is something known as a hair cell. We'll talk about that later on in the video. So let's focus on this first part right here. So the pressurized sound wave, how does this arise? So let's think about clapping your hands. So you know that when you clap your hands, you can hear something, you make a sound. So let's pretend these two little lines are your hands and you're clapping them, so you're moving them together. So they start there and they end up about here. So You've got your hands and they move together. So since your hands are floating around in air, there are a whole bunch of little air molecules. So these little purple dots, they're just a whole bunch of these little air molecules just kind of sprinkled. They're filling in the gap uh, in between your hands. They're just, you know, there's a lot of space between them, so they're nice and happy. But when you bring your hands together for a quick second, they actually experience this really high area of pressure so now they're all kind of pushed together and they don't really have much space to, to move around and and just chill so you've got this area of really high pressure over here for just a second so this area of high pressure actually ends up resulting in little pressure waves that kind of move away from your hands and they move away in all directions so they move away over here and some of them kind of move away up here so you've got these pressure waves that are formed and these pressure waves are basically just areas of high and low pressure. So if you were to actually look at a graph of this, it would look something like this. It looks something like this. So you'd have this pressure wave, which is basically just an area of high and low pressure. So up here you've got high pressure, and down here you've got low pressure. And so basically this clap resulted in this sound wave over here. So if you were to look at something else, like uh, if for example, me talking, the sound wave that would uh, be uh, that would result would actually look a little bit different. So the vocal cords uh, in your throat actually start vibrating when you talk, and so that vibration produces a similar pressurizes air and produces a similar kind of pattern of sound waves that move away from this source. So when I'm talking, it might look like something. It might look something like this. So it might look a little bit different might look a little bit different. So as you can see, these two frequencies, so let's call this F1 and let's call this F2. So this is the frequency that arises from me clapping my hands. This is the frequency that arises from me talking. So they're different. And most sounds that naturally occur are actually a composition of a couple of different frequencies. So if we were to add these two together, we get some messy looking sound wave that kind of looks like maybe like this. So let's call this F3. So it doesn't look very clean, and your brain actually has the job of taking this and breaking it down to, into its component frequencies. So that's something that your brain is able to do. So if I'm clapping and I'm, I'm talking at the same time, it creates some kind of weird sound wave like this, and your brain can actually uh, break this down and realize that they're two different sounds. So let's look at this second part now. Let's look at the receptor. So you've got these sound waves, and they're moving away from the source, but what happens next. So I have a diagram of the ear here and we're just going to look at that. We're going to look at this diagram of the ear. So don't worry about the parts that I blurred out. Just look at, the, we'll, I'll explain each little structure. So we've got these sound waves coming in. So I clap my hands and it causes these sound waves and they start coming in. They're just these big waves. And the first thing they hit is the outer part of the ear, which is the part of the ear that you can actually see. It's called the pina. So the pina right here. So the pina diverts these sound waves this way. So it diverts them down this structure called the auditory canal. So this is the auditory canal. So sound waves come from the outside and then come inside your head through the auditory canal. And the first structure that the sound waves actually hit is something called the tympanic membrane or eardrum. And so when they hit this eardrum, it actually causes it to move back and forth. So the eardrum starts vibrating at the same frequency as these sound waves. So the eardrums are moving back and forth. So 
use the eardrum, and it's actually connected to a couple of tiny little bones. So the first bone it's connected to is something called the malleus, and it's this structure right here. So the malleus, I'm just underlining that. The malleus is connected to the incus, which is up here, so the incus, and then the incus is connected to the stapes. So these three little bones start vibrating back and forth at the same frequency of the sound wave. And so basically, um, let's just also break this down real quick. So these structures, so the malleus, the incus, the stapes, and the eardrum, all together are known as the middle ear. So this is the middle ear. And this outer part with the auditory canal and the pina is known as the outer ear. So this is outer ear out of here. And this next part that we haven't yet gotten to over here is something known as the inner ear. So the cochlea and the auditory nerve is the inner ear. So I'll just label those for you real quick. So basically what happens now is the stapes is connected to this little oval uh, elliptical membrane which is called the elliptical window. So the elliptical window basically starts getting pushed in and out uh, along with the stapes, so it's getting pushed in and out. And this elliptical window is actually connected to the structure called the cochlea. So the cochlea is actually filled with fluid. So if we're gonna, let's just zoom in a little bit just to look at this a little bit closer. So this cochlea right here is actually filled with fluid. And so as this elliptical window is getting pushed in and out, so let's say it gets pushed in just a little bit, it actually pushes against some fluid which is inside the cochlea and it causes the fluid to move this way. So the fluid basically moves this way all the way to the tip of the cochlea and then it comes back out. So once it hits the tip of the cochlea, it actually comes back out in this other direction. So now we've got fluid moving this way and all the way back over here. So the reason why the fluid actually goes all the way to the tip of the cochlea is because the cochlea is split in half by a structure, which I'm just going to draw here in pink. So there's actually this structure that goes all the way to the tip of the cochlea and it kind of splits it right in half. And this structure is called the organ of corti. Organ of corti. So basically this organ of corti splits the cochlea in half and causes fluid to flow on one side of the cochlea all the way around. And once it reaches the tip, there's actually a little hole in the organ of corti that lets the fluid pass from this side of the cochlea to the other side. So at the tip, it kind of passes through the organ of corti and comes back around. And so now when it comes back around, the fluid actually pushes against another little membrane called the circular window. So this little circle right here actually gets pushed and it kind of pushes out. And so you've got this membrane getting pushed in and this one getting pushed out. And then this one gets pushed in and then this one gets pushed out. So there's basically just fluid flowing back and forth inside the cochlea. All right, so let's go ahead and zoom out. So let's just look at the cochlea in a little bit more detail. So we'll just kind of look at the uh, the cochlea and, and look at how uh, at what happens next. So let me just draw a little cochlea. So it's this round snail-like structure, but let's go ahead and unroll it. So let's just unroll it and lie it flat. So if we unroll it, it'll look something like this. It'll look something like that. So basically this is just a flattened cochlea. And so you've got this little bone that we were talking about earlier, which is called the stapes. So you've got this little bone right here. It's called the stapes. And this stapes is connected to the other two bones and then the eardrum. So it's basically moving back and forth at the same frequency as the sound wave that's making the eardrum move back and forth. And this stapes is connected to this little oval membrane called the elliptical window. And the elliptical window gets pushed in and out as the stapes moves back and forth. So as the elliptical window gets pushed in, there's fluid inside the cochlea. So we've got fluid inside, and that fluid basically gets pushed all the way around the cochlea and then comes back around. And as I mentioned before, the reason that it the fluid flows in this direction is because there's actually a structure right in the middle. There's this little structure, and we call it the organ of cordae. So this organ of cordae kind of splits the cochlea in two, and the fluid can only flow in this direction. So when the fluid gets over here, there's this little round window. The little It's actually called the circular window, and the circular window gets pushed out a little bit as the fluid kind of compresses it. So now you've got fluid flow um, back and forth around this organ of cordae. 
So what we want to look at now is we just want to look at a cross section, just a little cross section of this organ of cordae so that we can kind of understand what happens. How does it turn these this fluid motion into sound? So if you actually kind of look at a cross section, what you would see is something like this. So something like this. So you've got an upper membrane and a bottom and a lower membrane. And you've also got these little hair cells. So you've got little hair cells with little, little shark fin looking things on the tops. So you've got these little hair cells. And basically, as there's fluid flow around this organ of cordae, it goes like that. And then the fluid kind of comes around and goes this way. So as we have fluid flow, it actually pushes down on this membrane and pushes up on this membrane. So you can kind of imagine how this fluid flow works. So as this membrane gets pushed up and down, it actually causes these little hair cells to move back and forth. So they're moving back and forth, they're vibrating, and basically what we can do is we can blow up these hair cells so we can blow them up and look at them in a little bit more detail. So it kind of looks something like this. So there's their shark fin part, and then there's the cell. So this shark fin part actually is called the hair bundle. Hair bundle. And these aren't actually hairs. What they are is they're, they're just a bunch of little filaments, and let me just draw it in a little bit bigger. So if we were to look at just the hair bundle, it would look something like this. It would look something like this. And each one of these filaments is called kinocilium. Kinocilium. Um, so basically, a whole bunch of these little filaments are attached to one another and they form the hair bundle. So each kinocilium is actually connected to one another by this little spring-like structure called a tip link. So it's a little spring-like structure and each one is called a tip link. So it links the tips of the kinocilium. So if we were to actually look at a tip link, so let's go ahead and look at just this, the tip of this kinocilium. If we were to look at just the tip of this kinocilium, it would look something like that. And you've got the little tip link attached to it. So you've got this little spring-like structure attached to the tip of this kinocilium. And in fact, the, the tip link isn't attached to the kinocilium directly, but it's actually attached to the gate of a potassium channel. So there's the little gate right here. So this is the little gate of a potassium channel. And so as these hair cells, as the little kinocilii get pushed back and forth because the fluid is moving in the cochlea, as they get pushed back and forth, it actually stretches on this spring. So let's say that the kinocilium gets, gets stretched, sorry. We're going to use this color over here. Let's say that the kinocilium gets stretched. It actually kind of looks like this. So now it's getting stretched. And as it gets stretched, it actually opens up this gate. So as the potassium channel gate opens up, there's potassium outside that then flows into the cell. So you've basically got potassium out here flowing into the cell. And there are actually all these other little channels, uh, calcium channels, that get activated when potassium is inside the cell. So now you also have calcium flowing into the cell. So the, uh, the flowing of potassium and calcium into the cell basically causes the cell to fire an action potential. So it basically stimulates uh, another cell, which is known as a spiral ganglion cell. And the spiral ganglion cell then activates another cell that uh, is part of the auditory nerve, which then goes to the brain. So basically this goes to the brain. So this is what happens when a sound wave um, gets uh, comes into the ear and then gets transmitted into a neural impulse by these little hair cells.